Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Um, can you hear me? Can, especially the back of the room. All right. So last time we talked about charges, the fundamental observable of electricity, which is that uh, like charges repel each other, unlike charges attract. And uh, today I'd like to uh, go on and uh, discuss a little bit more about that force that was observed. We established this notion of the point charge, which is reminiscent of the point masses that comes into Newton's law of gravity. So indeed, Newton had showed that between two masses, there is a force that varies as 1 over the distance between the two masses squared. So you see here again the notion of the point mass is at play because unless you have a point mass or a point charge, you cannot talk about a distance. Uh, if it's not a point, then the question is which place, let's say on a sphere, are you choosing to determine the distance with the other sphere? So all these relate to this notion of the point charge that we discussed on Monday. So once this was discovered, people were trying to speculate, were started to speculate that a similar law would apply for electric forces. So the electric force between two charges, two point charges, Q1 and Q2. Does it vary as one over distance squared? And it was what uh, Coulomb actually announced in um, a, a famous experiment that indeed this is true. And uh, just to show you very briefly, I have posted a handout on this uh, Coulomb experiment because people don't realize that uh, Coulomb did not state the full law. He actually measured three points. He had a very precise mechanism of measuring forces between bodies. So he charged two spheres and he was able to figure out what is the um, force between uh, these two spheres uh, as a function of the distance between the spheres. So this is uh, the angle that's proportional to the distance and he measured these three points. So this is actually Coulomb's data and he showed that and the horizontal axis proportional is related to the distance. You can see the curve that the data should follow if the force was varying as one over distance between the spheres squared versus if it was following a law of one over distance between the spheres to the uh, uh, third power cubed or one over distance. So with these three points, Coulomb was able to announce in 1875 to the Paris Academy of Sciences that indeed the electric forces follow the same law that Newton had observed uh, for uh, gravitational forces. So this is uh, the Coulomb experiment. And now if we want to be a little bit more formal, the way that I will state uh, Coulomb's law for the purposes of our calculations is a bit more formal. So I will uh, put, I'll, will, I'll use first of all a coordinate system. I will define uh, two point charges, Q1 and Q2, now that they are point charges, they can be, I can assign a position vector to each one of the two. So this is uh, Q1 and this is Q2. You see right away that as a vector, the distance between the two charges is given by this vector here, let me call it R12. And this R12 
is basically distance vector from one from q1 to q2 and if you express it with respect to the position vectors of the two charges is simply r2 minus r1 so you see that r1 plus this distance vector gives you r2 so therefore this is equal to r2 minus r1 So we have the charges, we have the distances, and Coulomb's law says that the force one two, so force from Q one to Q two is equal to a constant, and I will explain each term in uh, this expression times the charges q1 and q2 so let me just put here a bracket so that you don't confuse where the words end and where the math starts divided by distance that is the magnitude of the distance vector to the third power and that may create a confusion. I talked about an inverse distance square law, but I multiply this by R2 minus R1. So this actually gives you information about, sorry, let me just mute again the projector. Okay. So this actually is a vector that has a length equal to the distance between the two. So you have Distance divided by distance cubed, so indeed this is an inverse distance uh, square law. I can make this a little bit more explicit by defining, and uh, that is an opportunity to introduce uh, here some notation, a unit vector, R12 hat. So if I define this R12 hat as a unit vector pointing from Q1 to Q2, so unit vector means it has length equal to 1, that's all. And the uh, direction is basically the direction of R12. So it is equal to R12 divided by its length. Okay, so that is the unit vector. Therefore, I can basically write this as follows. unit vector and now you see clearly that uh, the cube and the r2 minus or r1 in the denominator cancel out and you have this inverse distance square form of the law so i will prefer this one uh, this form of the law uh, because it will be more useful for calculations we do pertinent to fields electric fields uh, in uh, the next parts of the course so this is the law looks a little bit different than what you see in high school, which is uh, more Q1, Q2 by R squared uh, times a constant. So by the way, this constant here invokes epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is the dielectric permittivity of free space. And its value is 10 to minus 9 by 36 pi or 8.8542 and many more digits times 10 to minus 12. Uh, so if you do this 1 over uh, 4 pi epsilon naught, you will see that it ends up uh, being 9 times 10 to the 9th. So actually the numerical value for this constant as a whole is 9 times 10 to the 9th. Okay. So this is Coulomb's law. Any uh, questions up to this point? Now on Monday, I said that electric forces are humongous. So since we have the law, we can just do a simple example. 
take two electrons And let's try to calculate the gravitational force versus the electric force. So what Newton's law gives us is the gravitational force and the electric force between uh, the two electrons. Okay. And uh, let's say that uh, the two are at a distance uh, of uh, 10 to minus 12 meters. So obviously, these are electrons, so they have to be at a small distance. So what will be the electric force? That is given by uh, Poulomb's law. So I will compute the magnitude. Me again mute the projector once more it seems that okay so 9 times 10 to the 9th q1 q2 here i have the same uh, charges e times e e squared so that the charge of the electron is 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 the units are coulomb Q1, Q2, the distance is uh, 10 to minus 12 squared. Okay. So this force uh, turns out to be 2.3 times 10 to minus 4 newtons. So the unit of uh, force is newton uh, and that is 2.3 times 10 to minus 4. Now, if you redo this calculation for the gravitational force between the, which is attractive, force between the electrons, let me call it F sub G. Uh, the Newton constant is uh, 6.67 uh, times minus 11. The mass of the electron is 9.1 times 10 to minus 31. Distance 10 to minus 12. And this is 5.52 and maybe I will just write it and Say this is 5.52 times 10 to minus 47. So indeed you have a humongous difference between the electric force, which of course here is uh, repulsive, and the gravitational force, 10 to minus 47. So this gives you an idea of how strong the electric forces are. Uh, so this was a simple example to calculate uh, the Coulomb force. Um, I focused, as you see here, in magnitude. I will do more examples with uh, vectors. But any questions up to this point? Yes? Uh, what is the unit of uh, dielectric permittivity of free space? So right now, the unit of dielectric permittivity, you can take it from the law itself to be Coulomb squared by meter squared newton okay uh, but later on we will see that it is farad you remember the unit of capacitance per meter so we will show that it's equivalent to farad per meter but i have another question so if these electric forces are so huge and at the same time um, the like charges repel how come nuclei are put together that have a bunch of protons. So how are these protons held together in nuclei? Yes? Is some force which is higher than 
So there are nuclear forces that are, uh, you had another idea. I think it's the strong force. So there are nuclear forces that are keeping the nuclei together. Those forces vary as one over distance cubed and higher powers, and therefore at larger distances away from the nucleus, they are overridden by the electric force, the Coulomb force. So 1 over r to the power of cubed will actually decay much faster than 1 over uh, r squared. And therefore, these forces are important within the nucleus so they keep it all together, but then they decay quickly outside. And um, of course, just putting the nucleus together, the uh, nature uh, has to consume a lot of energy, and that's why nuclear fusion, nuclear reaction is so important as a source of energy these days. Uh, last, uh, uh, in the last lecture, I showed you a small slide uh, before I erase the board and move on to some comments on the law. Let me just uh, repeat this slide here. Okay, with uh, this uh, nuclear reactor, it's uh, a reactor that promises to uh, do fusion uh, without neutrons. Neutrons that are emitted from a nuclear fusion can damage the walls of instruments that are producing them. So this is one very exciting area of technology. You can uh, read about it in uh, Spectrum. This particular company, TAE, that makes those uh, neutron-free uh, reactors with uh, plasma cannons, uh, it has actually a current uh, capitalization of $1.2 billion. So it is a big market and uh, one that uh, takes advantage of this humongous energy that is stored within um, uh, nuclei. So I'll stop here with this and we'll go back to some comments on the law. In fact, I will mute the projector and I will have to erase the board. So, maybe I will keep the formula here and then um, So we have everything uh, with respect to the law here in the middle of the board, uh, including this constant of 9 times 10 to the 9th uh, that is in front of it. And uh, I just want to make some uh, comments on the law itself. As we mentioned on Monday, all these laws and all these equations are really judged against experiment. Uh, are they uh, consistent with observables? And uh, the fundamental observable and the most important observable is indeed that like charges uh, repel and opposite charges attract. Does this satisfy this observable? So you see that uh, We have two cases. If the product of Q1 and Q2, Q1 and Q2 are algebraic quantities, so it can be positive or negative. So when the product of Q1 and Q2 is positive, then you see that this force, which by the way, vectorially, as you see here, is along the direction of the line that connects the two charges, then this force is along the direction of this R12 hat. So R12 points from 1 to 2. And then if Q1, Q2 is positive, then the force is actually co-directional with R12. So the force is repulsive. So this is consistent with 
the fundamental observable. On the other hand, if Q1, Q2 is negative, so Q1, Q2 are opposite to each other, then you see that this will be negative and the direction of this vector will be opposite to the direction of this vector. So therefore, we will have this situation. Q1 is here, Q2 is here, and then R12 points from 1 to 2, and the force now points in the opposite direction. So it is attractive. So that is uh, a, first, uh, a first note. So second note is that uh, how about the force F21? Well, all I need to do is go here and replace 1 and 2. And you see right away that F21, that is the force that Q2 applies on Q1. Is exactly opposite to F12. So if I change R1 and R2, 1 and 2, so put here 2, put here 1, put here 1, here 2, here 1, here 2. The only thing that changes in this expression is really the sign of this parenthesis. And you get a force, you get a result that is exactly opposite to F12. So you see that this force satisfies this action-reaction principle uh, that we see also in gravitational forces. So F12 is exactly opposite to F21. We said that this is uh, an inverse square law and uh, Third note, the most common form of the law that you will see is when the first charge is at the origin. Of our coordinate system. So what happens then is we have Q1 here and then uh, that means R1, the position vector of the first charge, now that I moved it to the origin, is zero. Let's say Q2 is here. And you see now that the position vector of uh, Q2 is uh, coincides with what we would call R, the position vector x, x hat plus y, y hat, z, z hat for this point. So there is no need any more. I don't have essentially one and two anymore. The one has been moved to the origin. So therefore I can call this R. Uh, and uh, the law is simplified in this case. Uh, the magnitude of R vector is R and then that capital R is the radial coordinate of the spherical coordinate system. So there are three coordinate systems I have posted a fairly detailed um, handout online uh, about coordinate systems and various things uh, that are useful from vector calculus. So three coordinate systems we'll be using. Uh, the Cartesian, obviously, the uh, cylindrical and the spherical. So now, when you put the first charge at the origin, this, the uh, length of this vector coincides with 
its uh, radial coordinate in the spherical coordinate system, which is precisely the distance of the point from the origin. So I can call this R. I don't need to call this R2 anymore. So I call this R. And uh, in this case, the law becomes the constant 9 times 10 to the 9th or 1 over 4 pi squared Q1, Q2 divided by R squared times the unit vector R hat. So this unit vector in this direction that points to the, from the origin to the point. And R hat can be expressed in terms of the uh, spherical coordinates as follows. So this is the radial unit vector in the spherical coordinate system. And since we are in the topic of coordinate systems, let me just complete the picture by saying and introducing the notation that we'll be using in the course. And maybe there might be some slight notational discrepancies with what you saw in vector calculus uh, courses in mathematics. But uh, we really follow the established notation in the physics literature here. And the spherical coordinate system has these three coordinates. So again, if we look at the point where the charge is, we can define, first of all, the radial coordinate that we just used, that is the distance from the origin. Okay. Then we have the angle theta from the z-axis. And then if we project this point on the xy plane, we connect it anew to the origin. So I have this point P, I project it on the xy plane, I take uh, this P prime, then I, have, I can define this angle phi from the positive x-axis. So the spherical coordinates are these r, theta, and phi. So this is the spherical coordinate system that I invoke in Coulomb's law. And I invoked it here in Coulomb's law, the spherical coordinate system, because when you are looking at this system that creates the force, this point charge at the origin is, as we say, spherically symmetric. That is, if you are an observer and you start changing your theta coordinate. You start changing your theta coordinate. So imagine that you start from a z axis and you start changing your, z, uh, your theta coordinate like this. You are looking at the charge and you see exactly the same thing. It doesn't, nothing changes. So you still see a point and you are at a fixed distance from the point and there is no reason why you would experience a different force from a system that looks exactly the same. Okay, your theta coordinate changes because you choose to express your position in terms of a coordinate system, but the physics doesn't change. You are still at some distance of 10 meters, let's say, or 10, 12 nanometers from a point. You need to observe the same physical effect of that point. Okay. Um, same thing here, if you change your phi coordinate, you are going around the point. You are seeing exactly the same thing. It's just like going around the CN Tower and you don't know exactly which place you are because you always see a concrete cylinder coming up. I know that this uh, in, is not exactly accurate, but so imagine that you have a concrete cylinder, you go around it, you always see the same concrete cylinder. So same thing here, you go around the charge 
and then you see exactly the same thing, just one point. If you see the same thing, is the same source, which is the charge, you should expect to see the same effect. And that is what we call spherical symmetry here, that if we change any other coordinate except for the R coordinate, we see exactly the same thing. And that is really particular to the point charges, and that is why it makes so much sense to invoke spherical coordinates to write this loss, uh, same thing with the loss of gravitational force. So that now brings me to a very important definition that uh, we'll be using for the rest of the course. And that is the electric field. So I go back again to this uh, Coulomb force law, that F12. And I say that what if I was dividing both hand sides by Q2, by the second charge? Remember F12 is the force of the one charge on the other. So then I would come up with this expression F12 divided by Q2, which is equal to our constant Q1 Okay. So you see that this ratio is now independent of Q2. It's independent of Q2. And that is also, that has units of Newton per Coulomb, obviously, because I divide a force by a charge. So I call this quantity, this force per charge quantity, the electric field that Q1 has created in the position of Q2. So this is my definition for the electric field of Q1 at the position of Q2 that I call R2 through the position vector of this second uh, charge. So this is the electric field created by of Q1. So the electric field is basically force per unit charge. When you, uh, when you are holding a cell phone and you can measure the electric field somehow in the position in the area of your cell phone to be so and so typically in the microvolt per meter as we will see now we introduce the unit of the electric field as Newton per Coulomb. Later on we will see a more uh, common way to uh, use uh, a more common unit for the electric field is actually volt per meter. So if you are holding a cell phone, you have some micron volt, volts per meter that you have in the area. That means that the charges in the antenna of your cell phone will be experiencing the electrons, will be experiencing force Q times that electric field charge times that electric field. So that force is what will create the current, which current will create the signal, which signal uh, will be decoded by the digital part of your receiver and eventually will convert to voice, data, video and so on that, uh, that you are receiving. So fundamentally speaking, the electric field is force per unit charge and that's how it is defined. So now that I did the Q1 and Q2 stuff, let me just make a definition based on a charge Q, drop these indices, which is a little bit easier, and say that if I have Again, and uh, I am a, a little bit uh, 
I, I take the tedious road of defining arbitrary positions of charges rather than placing them at the origin that you may have seen before because that will be more helpful going forward in the course. So I want to be as general as possible so that we can really do the next calculations in uh, as easy way as possible. So let's say that you have this charge Q uh, defined by a distance vector R prime. for Q, and then you have an observation point, not charge anymore, observation point that is defined by a distance vector R. So P is now an observation point. The electric field that I expect that this point, that this charge will create at point P So now this is observation point. Is Q divided by 4 pi epsilon not R minus R primed, no R3 r1 anymore times r minus r prime. So I basically take out the 1 and the 2 and I use, and you see here, I made the distinction between the position vector of the charge that created the field and the position vector of the observer. This is a, a form of a distinction that I will be using quite a bit, using that is prime coordinates for the source and unprime coordinates for the observation point. So this is the most general, uh, the most general expression. So let me uh, stop here. Ask if there are any questions. And uh, waiting for questions, I can clean the uh, rest of the board. So as a small example, or oh, any questions? Questions? Okay. So as a small example, then let me calculate the electric field for this uh, uh, electron that I uh, talked about before. You remember we, uh, before we calculated the forces between two electrons, let's say, let's uh, now try to look at the electric field that the electron itself would create a distance d equal to 10 to minus 12 meters. So that will be um, the geometry. Now I am putting this electron here at the origin. Uh, minus, obviously. So then the electric field will be minus uh, the electron charge uh, divided by distance squared in the radial direction which I will represent with a vector r hat. So r hat is the unit vector 
remember, that points from the origin to the position of my observer. So this points outwards. But now I have the minus sign that comes from the charge. And therefore, the field actually will be pointing inwards. So here, the field points inwards because you have this minus sign. And in fact, if you calculate the number, that ends up being 14.4 times 10 to the 14th newtons per coulomb. And you can confirm that if you multiply this by the charge of the electron, the 1.6 times 10 to minus 19, you will find the force that we calculated before, that 10 to minus 4 uh, Newton force, the 2.3. So how do you find the force? Let's say, so if we uh, actually look at this field, so the electric field points towards the electron, Okay, so if I bring in a proton, if I bring in a proton here, that will experience a force charge, which is positive, times the electric field, so it will be attractive. If on the other hand, I bring in an electron, like the electron we saw in the previous example, That will experience a force, so in the first case, the force will be positive. In the second, it will be uh, co-directional with the electric field. In the second case, if I bring in here an electron, electron charge, which is negative, times the electric field, will switch the direction of the force with respect to the electric field. So now the force will be repulsive. And uh, again, if you want to calculate the magnitude of that force, that will be 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 times this field, 14.4, 10 to the 14. So don't get uh, misled by the humongous number here. It will still be 2.3. The force will still be 2.3 times 10 to minus 4 Newton. Okay. So that is the electric field. So generally, and that you can see from the applets in, of your book as well, if you have a negative, if you have a positive charge, let me start from a positive charge, the elect and you want to plot the electric field okay, around the charge, let me just define some lines to plot it. Okay. The electric field vector, first of all, will be the magnitude of the vector decays as distance squared, just like the force. Because remember, ultimately, electric field is force per unit charge. So therefore, everything that we observed about the dependence of the Coulomb force over distance is inherited by the electric field. Okay, so it's one over distance squared. But the electric field vector will be decaying and it will be pointing away from the, from the charge. Like this. So it will be like this. How do I interpret this diagram? If I bring in a positive charge here, plus Q, it will experience a force along the direction of the electric field. So indeed, this is consistent with our fundamental observable that uh, the like charges should repel. On the other hand, if I had a negative charge, 
and I do the same exercise. And let me just put here the title for those of you who are taking notes and maybe you will see the diagram and we'll know where it comes from. So this is the electric field vector for a positive charge. So if I repeat this experiment, but now I start with a negative charge, then the electric field vector will be pointing towards the charge. And what does that mean? It means that if I bring in here again a positive test charge, that will experience a force that will drive it towards a negative charge. Indeed, positive and negative should attract each other. So if you remember these two pictures, this will come up again and again and again in almost half of the course. It is the most fundamental thing to keep in mind when you do, when you are thinking about electric fields, that the positive charges are sources of electric fields and the negative charges are sinks of electric fields. So here you see that the plus charge acts as a source of electric field, the negative charge acts as a sink of electric field. But obviously, we're not very interested in calculating fields of a single charge. Uh, we're more interested in calculating uh, fields of systems of charges. Let me see if I can bring in my... Uh, ...projector again to life. Okay, it doesn't look like it will cooperate, but I would just want to say that the more interesting, oh, there it is, the more interesting uh, problem that we're facing with respect to fields of charges is when there is many of them, when you have a system of charges. For example, a charged power line, and you want to find out whether the electric fields that are generated by the power line are within the safety limits that are prescribed by the government and the World Health Organization. So, for example, in Canada, we have limits of human exposure to fields that start from 3 kilohertz, go to all uh, 300 gigahertz. Uh, that is the safety code uh, 6 that is uh, uh, produced by Health Canada. And you see that there is limits for electric field uh, strength the electric field strength, uh, Newton per Coulomb, or volts per meter, as we'll see, in controlled and uncontrolled environment. And you see that the limits are lower in an uncontrolled environment. What does that mean? It means that if you are, for example, uh, someone who is handling a radar system, you know that you are exposed to radiation from radar, so you are expected to take some precautions. And, that, um, and then the code says that it is okay to go higher because you are expected to get some precautions. But if you are someone who passes by a base station, then that's an uncontrolled environment. We need to protect you more. The great thing about fields of systems of charges is a principle that's called superposition. That is, if I have now not just one charge, but two charges, I can just calculate the field that the one would produce in isolation, the field that the other would produce in isolation, add them up, and I get the field that they will produce combined. So we will talk about this tomorrow. 
uh, along with fields of uh, charge distributions like those in power lines. So thanks for your attention. See you tomorrow.